Okay, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, our roll call has already been done. Uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to review the minutes of January 11th. If you have, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I have a motion. Yes. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Alex. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed the same sign. Uh, let's talk about Sidgwick County tax sale update. Who's going to give us an update? Sure, I will kick it off at least. Um, um, we had a chance to pull together city staff and Sedgwick County staff um, for a second meeting to discuss um, tax sale and opportunities for the land bank to potentially acquire property through the Sedgwick County tax sale. Um, this time we also had legal representation from each of the entities to try to help understand and navigate some of the statutes and legal issues that could be involved within that. Um, I think it would be fair to say that we did not find common ground through that meeting. Um, there are some conflicting statutes between the understanding of the tax foreclosure and related sale process and the land bank process. Um, and so really it's kind of a matter of how are these being interpreted and deciding whether there are any ways to reconcile things, whether through legislative um, advocacy or other elevating it kind of to those levels. Um, so a couple of the key points from that meeting, we discussed the question of the minimum bids because right now in Sedgwick County, tax sale um, bids begin at $1 for any delinquent property that goes to tax sale. Um, and so the city had put forth a proposal to potentially begin um, tax sale processes with a minimum bid at the amount of taxes and interest owed, um, which would allow governments to fully recoup those funds um, rather than forfeiting anything that wasn't um, paid through that tax sale process. Um, Sedgwick County and their legal advisor feel strongly that the tax sale process should really present properties at the price the market is willing to bear. And so if a property, and for example, some of the properties that we would have interest in, if a property has say 14,000 in delinquent taxes and specials, um, but the market will only bear $2,000, then that is the price that Cedric County would feel is fair and equitable for that sale. And so I think it was really eye-opening and very helpful in at least understanding where each entity is coming from, but it didn't necessarily provide a way forward in some of the questions and the processes that we were hoping to find progress on. Um, our assistant city manager and have to apologize, I am blanking on his last name right now. Anderson. Troy Anderson, that's right. Um, he has past experience with land banks and talked a lot about kind of what the land bank model is nationally. Um, and really what we're finding is that in Kansas, just and at least in Sedgwick County, we're just looking at a very different framework that we're operating within than what that national model would be. Um, so I think there's a general consensus that there is a disconnect between some of the statutes. Um, there are still some pathways forward, um, but for the time being, the land bank will struggle to take properties in from the tax sale process. Uh, we can still try to intervene. We can try to reach out to property owners <coughs> before it gets to that tax sale process. Um, so that it is a, a transfer kind of at their discretion. Um, I guess one of the other questions that was mentioned was the question of would the city have the opportunity to put in bids without having cash transfer hands? And the answer to that question would be no. Um, if the city did bid on a property, the city would pay that eventual sale price. That money would be, then be dispersed the same as any funds through the tax sale process and then the city's share would come back to it but the share that would be owed to the county the school districts and any other taxing entities would go ahead and be dis dispersed out to those entities um, so those were the highlights that i had taken away does anyone else who was in that meeting have the only other thing i think is clarification was we've always been under the understanding that once the land bank took in a piece of property, the real 
real estate taxes could go away. And what we heard from the attorney for the county was that you could not do away with the past taxes. You could only change that going forward is what he, I, I understood him saying. That's not my understanding. No. What do you Would that be, for example, assessments against? Um, special assessments um, that are for infrastructure, not special assessments like related to board ups or demos. Or mowing, right? Those those all actually do go away um, retroactively. Those obviously don't go forward. But in a, in a case like that, the uh, retroactive up to the current year, current year isn't included in what's forgiven. Everything before the current year can be, but uh, a, a new owner has to take on those special assessments that are for infrastructure going forward. And yeah, if it comes into the into the land bank's hands, those back taxes can be forgiven. Specials. And so really the both our processes for getting some of the back taxes wiped away to prepare that property to go forward. Um, and so we're still wrestling within that framework of if if both the land bank and the county can clear um, delinquent taxes, trying to help people to understand why would they consider the land bank if that's going to happen either way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're not all, both on the same page in terms of the results. That's the whole problem. That's feeling probably turned into it too, and attitude toward that. Bottom line, uh, when you looked and had conversations about what change, maybe the legislative level on water bills, how do we get our hands? And that's really a. Uh, a discussion to have the city obviously would have to have a conversation with the council for them to take a legislative position to have uh, you know the the statutes changed in order to make that an easier passage where where things get confusing is is really in the processes the some of the other um, counties they have the option if, if they, they could put properties out for the amount of taxes owed and if not sold they would have to actually take go through the process to take possession of those properties before turning them over to the to the land bank and that's how other counties that works our county never takes possession and right. does not want to well, I know they don't yeah want to. absolutely does not want to and that's why there's not this ability um, for it just to transfer to the land bank because in order for that to happen, they would have had to take legal title and they're not willing to. What happened? Just said, sir? No, they sell it for a dollar. Or, you know, the, actually, the cheapest one was $157, I think. $157. Yeah. That's, they, don't just, they just don't own it. They just don't own it. And they're they're willing and able to sell, you know, no matter how much is owed to whomever, just so that they don't have to own it all. Yeah, in order for the city to be able, or the land bank, excuse me, to be able to take full advantage of the land bank statute, the county would have to first come into possession in order to be able to do that direct transfer. And there are other, like Sally mentioned, um, jurisdictions in Kansas that go through the steps that they have to do to come into possession at the same time they're doing their preparation for the tax sale and so it can happen instantaneously correct yeah that's not how it currently operates here which makes taking advantage of the land bank statute extremely difficult now one of the outcomes from that meeting um we can continue this discussion, but I'd love to share this next slide. Um, we were challenged as a staff to begin to develop some storylines around this. And so, as you know, we were successful in receiving Exhibit Ds from several tax sales through the years 2015 through 2020. Um, and so, did a little bit of computing. Um, I will say this is just a rough raft, um, but you can see the tax sale number is here. Um, I believe these are the filing years. And so I, I don't guarantee that I have every single tax sale from all of these years, but I feel like we've got a really good sample here. And you can see the general tax totals that are owed for each sale, um, the interest and penalties that have accrued, and then the total that is 
really should be coming back to the government agencies. Um, and so then this next kind of block of three shows the amount from that tax sale that was applied back to taxes, applied back to interest and the total applied. And so what I thought was really interesting is this final grouping where we can see how much did not come back, how much was not, um, how much was lost. And so obviously we have quite a bit of variance from sale to sale. Um, I found it really interesting that the sales that probably came out of the Great Recession period, we saw a lot of what looked like development startups probably going under, a lot of properties with similar um, parcel IDs and price points and things like that, um, large groupings that went through the tax foreclosure sale process. Um, and so you can see that depending on the sale, um, the lost tax revenue, lost interest, and the lost totals, we are coming in about two, two out of every three dollars was forfeited through the tax sale process. What were the dates on those sales? Do you have any idea? Um, I don't know in terms of like specific dates of the year. I could go back and look those up. Here. Um, so this one was the 2015 tax sale, this bottom. So 15, 16. Okay. So 15 would have been delinquents since 11, I believe. And so that would be um, things coming out of that period of hardship. Whereas this most recent, well, I guess I don't have the most recent one yet. So as we get those, we'll add those in. But you can see as economic conditions rebounded, some of those returns are a little bit better. But I think the averages are fascinating. You know, the rhetoric always is we got to get that stuff off the tax rolls and get it back in operation so we can add it back into the tax base. Yeah, same word. Do you want to talk about your plans for Exhibit A and how that feeds into Wes's? Class? Yes. Um, so, so far I've plugged in the Exhibit Ds, um, which what I've plugged in is only the details on the properties that have actually gone through the full tax sale process. Um, there's also a document called Exhibit A. And I actually have those for a wider span of years, um, but um, it includes information on every single parcel that entered the tax foreclosure proceedings. Um, so those that were redeemed as well as those that weren't. So we haven't built those out yet, but as we get those plugged in, we will be plugging in the parcel number, address, um, ownership information and things like that. And that should create a pretty powerful database to understand how many, um, and which parcels and potentially which property owners are cycling through this tax sale process. Um, we think that we probably will find some trends of properties. And again, we haven't done that yet, but probably have some properties that cycle through a couple of times in the <coughs> span that we have. Um, and that would be about all that we would expect with four years at least between each one. Um, so we're looking for some trends. Um, I'm kind of looking at, can I guess whether it was a homeowner or uh, just a property owner within that? Um, so that's not necessarily clear cut in what I'm looking at, but we're trying to build some data that will really help to continue to inform this storyline. Just a thought, project perspective standpoint, seem to be like there could be some identification Areas these is as an example for anyone for that matter, and where there is a public bit of massive properties that on the tax sale at some point. Put factors together like incentives and all that other stuff together in this area. You wouldn't be asking the county as a policy to just you know, take possession and whatever else, but ask them to take possession on a specific case by case basis to make a project work. They won't do it. Mm -hmm. Because it would be a result in an improvement. I think. <coughs> it would seem possible to break it down under that. It's kind of like you know, doing one by one. I, I think that would have more merit to have a substantive discussion about the project, trying to make that work than saying, well, we want to do it everywhere. Mm -hmm. People can't get their hands right. And that was actually another concept that came through that meeting was that because of some of the limitations of our funding and the way that this land bank has been designed and constructed, we aren't necessarily interested in taking in every single parcel. No, no. Um, we, we very much would want to cherry pick. And the county, 
understandably um, feels that they don't want to see cherry picking going on within the process. And so those are places where we're just coming from different perspectives and that's okay. But I think certainly we, we are wanting to take a targeted approach. I think it makes sense. True target approach. Mm -hmm. Everything else might have. And so I went with that. I guess that's actually a good segue into the parcel review. Um, we continue to monitor reports on which parcels have been redeemed, and we celebrate that two within that focus area that we've identified have been redeemed. Um, so we continue to watch that focus area and we are mapping properties and taking them off the map as they're redeemed. I believe that Sedgwick County was targeting late summer, early fall for their next tax sale. And so we would expect to see redemptions pick up as we get further into the year. Um, and so next thing we wanted to do was to bring some potential parcels for you to be aware of that staff have continued to look at. Um, we had a directive to continue to monitor the 13th Street properties that are currently in the city surplus. And we are doing that. Um, however, in terms of land bank, there are some concerns with the 13th Street properties um, in terms of noise and things like that, and whether ultimately those would align with the CDBD eligible outcomes that we have to do through this process. Um, so we are continuing to monitor any activity on those, um, but also the conditions under which we would be um, evaluating those properties. And so one other that had come to our attention, actually two others, are two properties at 2046 East 9th and 1011 North Ash. And so two properties are actually both right here. These are both city surplus properties. Um, and so what makes these unique, and this picture actually is a view across both, so you can get a sense of the span. Um, the property, the 2046 East 9th, um, is demolished via CDBG funding. And so this property, this parcel is already, um, has CDBG money put into it, which means that anything that would come out of it needs to be CDBG eligible. And so our staff is going to be pulling environmental reviews and some other documentation from those earlier projects. We have not pulled those yet. Um, and we also had actually done an early analysis and assessment on those, I think, in December. And so we'll be packaging those up together and then sending them back out for the board to review prior to the next meeting. But those would be two city-owned parcels that could be piloted through the land bank to see just what our processes look like with that sort of intake. The ultimate. Yes. So my anticipation would be that we'll have those two within the next couple of weeks. It was the thought to build houses on them, to sell them to a developer, or what was it? Um, I think certainly affordable housing would be a desired use. I believe that the 2046 is actually zoned commercial. So there would be other eligible uses, um, and the land bank really can be used for either purpose as long as it's an eligible outcome. What is um, I don't, I don't have it right offhand. We will get that to you in the um, in the property evaluations. I'll see if I can pull up the size. It's on that your listing. While Logan's looking for that, um, one other thing that had come out of previous meetings was a desire for us to begin maybe doing even property by property title work in select areas to identify particular areas where maybe we want to be um, reaching out to property owners. And so um, our staff had received a map that it, the MAPD had built in February 2022. Um, and so then Lance also reached out to our developer partners, um, typically the ones that would use our home ownership program or other funds um, that would include Habitat, Mennonite Housing, some others, 
um, to find out the addresses of places where there's past or planned construction. And so I've got this split, our area split into two different screens. This is the north part. Um, and so on the left is the MAPD map. My understanding is that blue are lots that are vacant and red indicates lots that are vacant, but there's some use going on. And if you look across to where the little green dots are, those are addresses where developer partners have been active in construction. Um, and so we thought it would be interesting to put these side by side and maybe identify if there are any particular blocks where you would like us to do detailed work. Um, I would say on this screen, one potential example would be as I look here, there are three developments going on. And over here, obviously, there are a number of vacant lots. So that might be one where you might direct us to do additional, more detailed work. When you say developments, you mean houses, homes? Yes. Not commercial. Yes. What are the three something? Um, I'm sorry, this this is the 13th Street to 17th Street between Grove and Hillside. And I will say that the South Square Mile actually has quite a bit more. Okay, Lucia. I think that area that's popular green, Estelle, north of the 16th, 15th. Right in here? Yeah, and, and north. I mean, that looks like a lot of vacant. A lot of blue in there. And then a few developments. And then the South Mile, like I said, has quite a bit more. There are some pretty dense areas where there's been new infill development. Um, and so I think it's reasonable for our staff to take on maybe two, three areas, depending on how large they are, and to try to get at that more detailed title work. Juncture, you don't know whether they're home, uh, owned by the residents or they're rented. Probably most of them rented. Right. Um, so I would say most of these are most likely rock the block habitat properties over here. But on on the other lots, we don't know what their status is. Um, we do know which ones are most likely vacant, and we could also get in and try to look at ownership information. We can take some educated guesses as far as whether they're owner occupied or rentals. <coughs> I'd say go check out, especially the north piece. And it looks, up here. Go to the, well, go to the neck, the previous slide. Okay. I mean, I, I think that's where the most vacant lots, the most blue is. I'd look at Poplar to Stell. Okay. 15th there, and just get an idea of who owns those vacant lots, and whether that's things that we can help initiate to get housing started on. Excellent. We will plan to bring that back to next meeting then. Go to the next slide. Sure. If you want to look at the next one, I'd probably <coughs> on the rock the block. Well, they've really done a great job south of wherever the top second street is 10th. Uh, 12th, yes. I mean, they've done a great job there. How can we help them move farther north into some of the vacant lots? So potentially do some work on some of the vacant ones up here between 12th and 13th Street. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So far. And certainly with everything, um, you know, the more concentrated we can do with some of this development, the more that we can. Make a difference for the mm -hmm. neighborhood. Yep. Talk about lot sizes also when we're ready for that. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you want to go back to that. So the 1011 North Ash is just over 8,000 square feet. Um, that one also is noted as having CDBG requirements applying as well. And then the 2046 East 9th, which is the one to the south, um, just over 10,000. Are they adjacent? There's an other? alley between them, is that correct? Yes. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I have one on the back of my house, I agree with that assessment. <laughs> But it's buildable. 
Is the other property just to the west? It's 2046. Is that commercial or probably residential? So, residential. residential. So, really, turn that back into residential property. It's TF3. None of those are in a flood zone? No. One of those houses got all this park got turned into a flood zone a few years ago, and they were the FEMA maps. Deal with it. Make sure we have I'd say proceed with title work to see who did you know, we know who's entitled. I mean, I think we need to try to figure out what would plan B on those parcels as to whether or not we get habitat or somebody to work with it and yeah. contact builder to if they want to build portable houses. Yeah. Um I think Sarah mentioned she'll send the neighborhood and property eval sheets for those. It'll probably just be one. I mean, it'll be very similar. Um, and then hopefully we have some good news for you and me. Going back through these, we will follow up with those two areas and bring back some initial assessments at the next meeting. So, um, and the other thing that I did want to follow up on is Roger also still is doing property management with our public housing program. And so he's frequently out in the neighborhood. Um, he's started monitoring for construction activity in that area beyond the known partnerships that we have there. And so, so far we haven't seen a lot of additional, but that's something that going forward when he's out and about, he'll be keeping an eye out for, and we will be reporting back as we know more. What about CDBG? What's that? The fact that it has CDBG invested in it, it means that the end result has to be a CDBG eligible activity. Affordable housing is an easy, easy stamp for that. I'm actually celebrating because it, it, from the time I got here, it took me a, a, how long to get that church demoed? Working <laughs> <laughs> on it for years. Years. <laughs> so I'm like, if we go from this headache to try to get a demo to get it turned to doing something positive with it, I, it that's a huge celebration. And that's a really great question as far as the CDBG. I'm new as well, and so I'm learning quickly. Um, but CDBG is our primary funding source for the land bank activities. And so with some of the, and that stands for Community Development Block Grant. Um, it is a large grant that is provided to us. And within that, we run a number of different programs. Um, there are particular standards, particular reporting guidelines, and things like that. And so part of what we have to be cautious with in terms of the land bank is that when we start spending those funds, our reporting requirements also are triggered. And so we cannot invest those funds into any project that doesn't result in an outcome that aligns with the national objectives. And so in the last couple, I think it was last meeting, we actually turned down a couple of property opportunities because um, in the end, the projects were not going to be able to be in alignment with that requirement. Um, one was a parcel near um, 235, one of the bypasses. And we said that in the end, the remediation or the noise levels were high enough and it was gonna be prohibitive for the developer to feel like it was developable there um, under those stipulations. And we had another parcel offered um, as a potential donation that again wasn't really within our target area and we weren't convinced that we could develop it into an eligible outcome. And so we are being selective and strategic based on our funding source. We talk about affordable housing, but there are other opportunities in CPG, um, you know, hoping to acquire the land for a grocery store in a food desert would be a CDBG eligible amount. So there's other things we can do that um, I'd say at this point. Housing, just given the crisis that we're in with that. It's affordable up to 80% AMI. We're like Section 8 is to 50% AMI. So there, there is that. Yeah, CDBG is 80%.
Some people call that workforce housing. Oh. Workforce is really 80 to 120, but. <laughs> well, <that's it. laughs> workforce they're talking about. Yes. Of course. <laughs> 11 ash that's also a CDPG yeah, has, has um, CDPG requirement. Would you say, being that it is already done, keep it commercial since there is a big area? So it's, it's actually two family groups, a TF3, multi, it's actually done multi family. Oh. Oh. Could be duplexes, could be. I guess also on that note, from a lot of my research since I've arrived, um, many land banks are funded with general funds, which have far fewer restrictions. And so we are trying to work within the framework and the funding resource that we have. It just does mean that we're much more selective than we might otherwise need to be. So we also had planned today to. Um, our staff is trying to develop a tool that we can use to take a quick look at titles and assess just what sort of challenges or costs or things like that we're looking at. Um, Roger had pulled together some research and we're going to have Roger and Jeff kind of go through it. Jeff wasn't able to be here today, so we're going to hold that for next month. Um, so with that, that does bring us to other business or open discussion. Any other items for discussion? Anything else? Can you talk about clearing which comments clear on time? What's the city's process? I'm going to let Roger answer that one since he's been doing that research. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but we use security first time. That's correct. Yeah, I thought you probably did the comments. you any deal? We have a negotiated rate. They pay a lesser fee than the market. Okay, good. Shop around. Any other discussion? Or meeting? But if there's no other discussion or item, I would accept a motion to adjourn. Can I ask? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, back, aren't you? Can you give me that information on options you all talked about in terms of talking about what needs to be done city county county wide? Can you give me those what could happen, but it would take changes or whatever else I'm what they are? Yeah, yes, we can do that. I'd love yeah, I'd love to have Jeff give us an outline of what could possibly occur. And then maybe what it would take to get there. What it would take to get there, and maybe you know that legislative is that discussion between the city and the county, or what, what needs to be done. Very, very helpful. From the county, it sounded like they um, felt that we would need to go through a legislative action before they were going to be open to changing anything. Well, were you talking to the county commissioner? <laughs> We just have to see. I mean, I'd, I'd like to understand what, what we're up against. Agreed. I'll ask my question again. If there's no other discussion, I have a motion to adjourn. I get your own. A second? A second. All the favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Next meeting, March 8th, 130. Right here. So. Have a great day. Stay warm. Thank you, everybody.